Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Welcome to this episode of The Murder Part. Tonight, we will be looking at the case of Jean Benet Ramsey. I'm here tonight with my co host. Hey, Jeff, how you doing? Hey, very good. How are you? Doing well, Mike? I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. What are your initial thoughts about uh, this case before we get into it? So, th- this one was tough for me because having young kids at home, is, it's tough to read, especially with a young kid being murdered in, in a very brutal way. That's tough to read because the thoughts of my own kids running through my mind. And it makes me think about um, how, as counselors, we have to often separate our own stuff from that that we're hearing. And this, that kind of relates to me here, um, that we have to se- I have to separate my own emotions from this and be objective about it and just you know share my thoughts objectively, not related to how I feel about a child being killed. So it's tough to read this stuff, I think, probably for anybody. But um, that one hits me especially hard with that. So that's a good point, Jeff. I think what gets lost sometimes with these cases where a child is murdered is that a child was murdered, right? especially the high-profile ones where there's a lot of attention on the investigation and all the other strange elements. In this case, has a lot of strangeness to it. Oh, yeah. That really distracts from, from the terrible tragedy. No matter who committed this crime, a terrible tragedy occurred and someone lost their life. Right. Yeah, yeah. so it is tough. It, it is tough sometimes to separate from these types of cases. What are your thoughts, Mike? Well, this is a case that's been, well, it's everywhere. And it's it's one of those cases that, like, I personally have experienced a bit of the, the Mandela effect on this one, where I, I don't remember a time when this case wasn't here. Mm-hmm. And I haven't, I, I've seen multiple documentaries on things. I never paid attention to dates. I've seen all sorts of things where, you know, we talked about all the stuff that's going on, but it wasn't until I sat down to actually review the case where I was like, well, this is 96. Oh, I was like 15. Like, but I, I can't remember ever going into a grocery store and not seeing a tabloid with her p- face on it. It's just a, it's a, a, a ubiquitous case. It's, it's part of the zeitgeist. It's part of, of Americana at this point. Yeah, if you look at like the really, the really uh, notorious true crime cases, uh, you know, Ted Bundy, um, Golden State Killer, Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, Eileen Wernus, Malin McCann... Jean-Benet Ramsey is one of those kind of like you know, Scott Peterson, mm-hmm. you know, one of those cases that everyone knows about. It is part of the culture. Yeah. You know, the, the circumstances of the case, the odd letter that was left at the scene. And I mean, there's people who, you know, they, they recite parts of it. Like it's people know about this case, you know, for whatever reason. 1996 is an interesting year because I think it was the Darley Rotier. Dar- Darley Lynn Rotier, Rotier. Yeah, pronunciation's not our strong suit. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Something like Rotier. Um, that case occurred in '96, and it did. it's you know again like people know all the details of the case that involved right. two deaths of children. Terrible, terrible case. One we've covered on on the murder part. Right. So check it out. Yeah, yeah. Take a look at that episode. Pr- pretty good episode. Uh, very interesting case. Another. Uh, I don't want to call them classics, but you know just those notorious cases that. Everyone knows. It's almost like to be involved in true crime, to be interested in it, you have to have looked at those cases. It's part of the primer. <laughs> so, Mike, to your point, uh, when she was murdered, I was seven years old. So, literally, you know, I probably didn't really know much before I was seven years old, didn't really realize much. But I would see tabloids and on the news and everything. And from seven years old until, you know, present day, it seems like every six months, or so, we're still seeing it on, and we see a big picture of Jean Benet on the front of tabloids. And you go through the grocery store line, and you see it, and you're like, now, when I was seven, I was like, well, what? You know, I'm thinking, why doesn't anybody just find her or find out what happened to her or something? But all you ever saw was just this, these big pictures of Jean Benet because they had so many, um, so many pictures of her being in the pageants. And it, you're right, it's just, it's, it's always been a part of our lives. Um, and especially for those who, those of us who were born in the late 80s, early 90s. That's all we've ever known is John Bonet and this the mystery surrounding it has always been there. Yeah, it's one of those cases that permeate permeates true crime. And it becomes you know, you're you're kind of forming an opinion on it, it becomes kind of like part of your your understanding of true crime. Like where do you stand on Scott Peterson? You know, where do you stand on Casey Anthony? Where do you stand on O. J. Simpson? You know, where do you stand on John Bonet Ramsey? So let's take a look at the timeline. We'll start uh, with 
the, the day that uh, Patricia Ramsey, I think she went by the name Patsy, right? Yep. Uh, Patsy calls the police. We're going back to December 26, 1996 in Boulder, Colorado. The house has been described as a mini mansion. Something like 6,000 square feet? Maybe a little bit yeah. over that? Yeah, and apparently uh, after the murder, after everything happened, nobody wanted to buy that house. And someone ended up buying it, and then they tried to sell it, and they couldn't sell it. So they moved away, but they still owned it. I think they actually moved back. Mm. Uh, but those uh, you know, murder houses, um, once, a, once a homicide occurs in a house, unless you're talking about something like uh, the one in Amityville or something where it kind of goes the other way, usually they don't do well. Right. Usually pretty much wipes it out. And the Ramseys actually moved immediately after. Right. Like they, like they never went back in the house like after after that yeah which is understandable i can so, completely understand that yeah. yeah certain houses get destroyed like uh, john wayne gacy's house is just destroyed and, and the uh, address was even changed btk i'm pretty sure they uh took that house down as well yeah, i believe that one's a vacant lot now yeah. yeah 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 so uh anyway so a very nice home in boulder colorado and we see that uh john and patricia ramsey live in the home and they have, I think it's a nine-year-old son. At that time, yeah, it was nine. Burke. And six-year-old John Benet Ramsey. And I guess her name was a combination of, of the parents' names or something. I think the dad's first and middle name? Yeah, I, I think it was. But it was it was definitely after his first name. And her middle name was Patricia, which is after her mother. So it was John Benet Patricia Ramsey. Okay. I think the dad's middle name was Bennett or something along those lines. Okay, okay. so that's how they, they formed that. It's right. an unusual name. So... Patricia Ramsey, Patsy. She I always it spell it wrong. What's that? I, I always spell it wrong because it's always pronounced Jean Benet, so I always spell it like J E A N, but it's J O N. It's not French. It's not. It's not. It's not actually French. It's it's John Bennett, right. Patricia Ramsey. So right. I always get I always get it wrong. I wonder why they didn't pronounce it John Bennett. Because Jean Benet sounds more feminine, I believe. Well, in the pageant life, I would imagine Jean Benet right. would be very welcome. Much more. Oh, that sounds. Like, uh, it sounds French. It sounds foreign or, you know, something. And yeah, John intriguing. Bennett, that would be like, who, who's coming out here to do a pageant so right is now? Is there a little boy coming out here, John Bennett? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> no, so, yeah, I think Jean Bennett, you know, definitely struck as more feminine and, and more French and more appealing yeah. in, in that aspect. Right. So, um, Patsy calls 911 at 5.52 a.m. on, again, we're December 26, 1996. To report that she found a ransom note. So this case starts with the detection of a ransom note. And this note becomes, I think it's probably the most interesting bit of evidence outside of, uh, you know, the, the murder victim's body that was recovered in this case. But at this point, we're not talking about a body. It was just a ransom note. And it was on a staircase going to the basement. The note suggested that her, again, Jean-Bene Ramsey, six-year-old daughter, had been kidnapped. I think it was coming from the second floor. It was coming floor. from the second floor down. They had two staircases. They had one main staircase uh, in a, off the big foyer. And then they had a back one that went down from... A spiral staircase, yeah, too. Yeah, that went, went from, from that to the kitchen. And it was it was in the morning, and Patsy was heading down to go make her coffee or do her morning routine. Uh, so it was between level one and two. Yeah. So it was okay. between level one and two, and she, she found it on the stairs there. Right, well, so I she, mean, I wonder what would have happened, of course, if she went down the other staircase. You know, how, how would this have been that much different? But that, that actually is another uh, interesting point that comes up is like that, that it was an indication that, who, you know, whoever wrote that note, if it's somebody outside the family, knew their routines because they knew where Patsy was going to come down because she did every morning. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, she came down from the second, down the spiral staircase into the kitchen and they left it there so she would find it in the first thing in the morning. It was also closest, the closest staircase, I think, to where the notepad was. It was. That whoever wrote it used. Yeah. Uh, I think they, they were very close to each other, within 15, 10 or 15 feet, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it brings up a lot, of, a lot more questions than answers. Yeah, so upon, upon the discovery of this note, we see that Patsy not only calls 911. And this is pretty early in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I know a lot of people get up that early. I don't, but a lot of people do. She also called family and friends, telling them that she could not locate John Bonnet. And the ransom note specifically cautioned against that activity. Right. So right away, no respect for the wishes of the, 
a kidnapper or murderer or whatever she thinks they are, right? So the police arrived three minutes later. I'll say, to be fair, if I had a child and found a ransom note and couldn't find my child, oh, no, I'm not saying she did I would call the police. No, no, I'm not saying she did the wrong Immediately. thing. Immediately. Yeah, but there was no, like, it's one thing, like, you see that says don't call anybody. You know, of course you're going to call the police. Like, that's the only way you're, you know, that's, that's going to maximize your chances of a positive outcome. But why would you call the family and friends? Like, that yeah, seems right. like you're just, one of them could have been the perpetrator. Mm-hmm. Like, you're, you're, I think you're tempting fate. You, know, you have to keep it kind of subtle. Yeah, you know, call the police, let them handle it. I wouldn't go telling everybody, you know. Well, I think one of the interesting points about the Ramseys is they had a, their their social cir- circle was very close. They were very close with all the people they had, that they knew. All the family and friends that that she called were people that she would have called for literally anything. I think if if she had to take Jean Benet to the hospital for a broken ankle, she would have been calling those people and saying, "Come over." Um, you know, I need the, I need this help. It was her support circle, so I can understand reaching out to those people. I wonder how she, m- she had oh, a lot of them. She had a lot of them. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I wonder how many of them had to do with the pageantry, uh, you know, life or whatever. Like maybe some of them she just knew very well because maybe they were into the pageant thing as well. Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to understand their their culture. Very very wealthy, um, and so maybe that was part of it too. Just that. They had the time, and Patsy in particular had the time and availability to really hang out with a lot of people, and therefore get that close, and would call would be okay calling them at any hour for anything. So maybe it's a cultural thing. I know you said you said the police showed up like three minutes later. I think it was only a couple minutes after that when the first of her family and friends started showing up too. And and according to the police, started destroying evidence right away, um, yeah. washing things on the countertop, and just you know. So and this is why. In a situation like this, just calling the police will do. They'll take care of connecting with everybody they need, paramedics, FBI, whoever. Um, I found that unusual. It's also worth noting that the Boulder police at that point did not have a lot of experience with kidnapping cases. In fact, they had one person on the on the uh, force who was who had taken an FBI course in kidnap negotiation stuff, and he was on vacation that day. So he didn't even respond to it. Mm-hmm. And they'd had, I think, in Boulder, one homicide that year and two the previous year. So they didn't have a lot of experience with homicide investigations either. And so like, when you don't have a lot of experience with playing the playbook, a lot of things get done wrong. I had heard from the half-brother of Jean Benet that uh, when he got a business card from two of the detectives that had, had talked to him, one was... Um, one was for, let me see if I can get it right here. There we go. One was a narcotics uh, detective and one was an auto theft detective, like what it's, at least what it said on their business card. So he remembers seeing that and thinking, what, what are these guys doing here? Much to your point, uh, somebody referred to them as the B squad because everybody else was on vacation um, or off or whatever. It was the day after Christmas. And they didn't have a lot of experience in it, so they just had whoever they had available. The Boulder murder police were in, like, Aspen or Miami or something that day. Like, everybody was on vacation because it was the day after Christmas. Mm-hmm. The 26th of December, day after Christmas, everybody's on vacation. Yeah, so, and, and typically, uh, now Boulder's a pretty good-sized town, right? Boulder's not too small, but, but usually smaller <laughs> towns don't have well-rounded police forces in terms of, like, homicide, kidnapping, and all that. Right. But Boulder, I think, is a good-sized place. At least now it is. It is now. I think yeah. it... I'm sure that it's grown in the intervening time. Yeah, I think it's like an upscale... Very much. Very wealthy. Yeah, and there's wealthy. a university in Boulder as well, is my understanding. University of Colorado, I think. Um, so that... Uh, I think that had to do with the... Uh, I don't know, the... The feel of the town, if you will, that like, you know, as a, as a university, so that attracted certain people, but also obviously there was some wealth to be had as well. So somebody described it as a, as an oasis or something along those lines, because was, there's was a lot of mountains around it. So it was kind of separate from everything else. Not a lot of development right outside on the outskirts of, of Boulder. So it was um, uh, very different in my understanding that people would go there and, and remark on how different of a town it was uh, versus Big, other big cities that would just have development and suburbs and all that. They didn't really have that. Yeah, so a place where they probably felt safe and and surrounded by people that 
they were familiar with and right. were like-minded. So when the police arrived, again, three minutes, at that point, no evidence was destroyed that they knew of, like the, the guests that Patsy invited weren't there yet. It was just John, Patsy, and Burke. So going back through a little history, we know that John was married before. And I think he was, uh, he worked at some place making a pretty good amount of money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Um, computer company. Uh, right. Software. Yeah. I think it was computers. Yeah. Yeah. He, he did okay. I think his, well, his bonus we know was a lot like what the, the ransom note, the bonus from the year before, right. was close to what the ransom note demanded, around 118000 or something like that. Yeah. So Patsy, Patsy's pretty interesting. And he, he also had had a daughter who had died in a car accident prior. Right. From, oh, his, from his previous from his marriage. First marriage. Yeah. So he'd, he'd had a child who died already. Mm-hmm. Um, so Patsy has kind of an interesting history. She's, she's into pageants. She was, when she was young, younger, she was into pageants, like beauty pageants. Now, I'm not really familiar with these. I think a lot of people are not familiar, but people who are familiar tend to be very familiar. <laughs> right? so it's something you, I guess you're either in or you're not. It's a very devoted following. Right. Uh, so she was, uh, I don't know if she was successful, but she did it. That's what she did. And Jean Benet Ramsey was a beauty pageant contestant. Uh, Patsy had won at least one pageant. I don't know what the name of it was, but there's a video of her winning, you know, getting crowned uh, with that. So she was at least somewhat successful, mm-hmm. just based on just winning one of them, at least. Yeah, so I think I think with this part, and I don't know if this is going through the officers that are on the scene at this point, because I don't know if they knew what to think this early on. But this is an odd history for someone, the other saying someone's missing, Jean-Baptiste's missing, and she's six, and she's already a competitor in these beauty pageants. I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with this whole beauty pageant thing for kids. Mm-hmm. You know, it just seems... It can seem odd, you know, and, and I'm sure it, it's something that's fairly normal in certain cultures and all that. But from an outside perspective, you're not really, you don't understand it, or maybe if you do understand it, it just seems unusual. So Patsy won uh, Miss West Virginia beauty title in the, in the uh, Miss America pageant in 19... 19- in 1977. Miss America. I mean, that's that's pretty uh, yeah. significant. Yeah. yeah. She, she'd been in other pageants before there. In order to kind of, in order to get into that pageant, she would have had to have, One, you know, yeah. won or been, or placed in several other ones. Uh, and uh, her sister had also been in, in pageants who won uh, Miss South Charleston at 24, at age 24 in 1980. So it was a family thing in her family. Yeah. So trying to be, you know, sensitive to the, to the fact that this is a cultural norm for for certain people, these pageants are what they do for a living, and I'm sure they're they're nice people and all. Why do you think this strikes so many people as, well, to, to use the words of many, creepy? What is it about this behavior, especially with like a child? I mean, an adult, you know, adults do what they want to do, but having a child, especially six, we're not talking about like uh, 16 or 17, six. I, I think it's the outfits. It really is the child beauty pageants don't have their own set of rules. They follow the same like rules and outlets of adult things. Like the fashions that are seen in the child beauty pageants are identical to what you would see in adult pageants. So you see a lot of six-year-old girls wearing like su- swimsuits that are very revealing and, and costumes and things that seem to be very revealing. And when you compare, like this is a six-year-old child wearing this outfit and here's a, you know, 26-year-old woman wearing this, you know, virtually identical outfit, you, you know, people equate the two together. And because there's a sexual component in seeing a 26-year-old woman in a very revealing outfit, that transfers over. It's kind of the transitive property, right? Right. Being sexualized like that, or, or that's what maybe the perception That's what is. I think people yeah. might believe. And I, yeah. uh, you could talk about perhaps consent as well. You know, what's a six-year-old going to consent to if their parent is saying, well, let's do this. I, I'm sure that, I'm sure that to some extent, most, most, uh, most parents are, are making sure that the child is okay with this. And, you know, is this something you want to do? But at six years old, I'm not sure what exactly you're going to 
you know, get from there that that's going to be genuine. You know, right. one other thing that we could compare it to that would come years later. Uh, you guys remember that show? Here comes Honey Boo Boo. Unfortunately, I've never seen it, but I know what you're I've never seen it. Un unfortunately, I am familiar with it. It's one of those things for me anyway, that I would like, you know, see commercials or something and be like, that's, that's weird. So uh, that came out, um, 2012. So that was, uh, about a beauty pageant contestant, uh, Honey Boo Boo, Elena, uh, Thompson. And so the perception of it, at least for that show is this is strange. Look at the way the mom and whomever else are acting. Um, so that was something that TV, that, uh, the media TV was really able to grab onto and uh, people were kind of laughing at it, you know? So I don't know if that was the perception in the mid nineties or it, not with things like that, because it's a reality TV show. Uh, they play up that dramatic angle. Mm -hmm. Like they play up how weird this is or how strange this is. And they try and push it up as far yeah. as they can, just because that's becomes the nature of the show. And the more people, more popular it gets, the more likely they are to do that. Right. But I think that there's, there's two aspects of the child beauty pageant part that that for people on the inside i think is way less sexualizing like from the outside perspective people look at it and go oh my goodness like they're sexualizing this but i think that for a parent of of a child they want to prepare their child for an adult version of this i want to get them used to wearing these kinds of clothes and get them used to you know performing in front of people and doing these things it's very similar to how a person who wants wants their child to be a violin uh soloist at some point or an actor, or an actor you know put, puts them into like where you're going to practice 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 and we're going to have recital after recital after recital where you're performing in front of people and and doing so with the beauty pageant side doing so in the same kinds of outfits you're going to wear later on in life it reminds me a bit of, of gymnastics yeah very like similar they start very like very young. shockingly young yeah and i have to wonder if that's good for development like all the stress of like the thing with the beam, you ever see the Olympics without that beam? Yeah. That looks that doesn't look safe. I would not be comfortable on that thing. I don't think I would be comfortable having a six year old on that either. But I do know that they, they generally don't practice six year olds on the high higher beams. They put them on a I'm one sure, lower yeah. on the ground so that they fall, they're not gonna get quite as hurt, but it's similar kind of balance required. The other aspect of the beauty pageants is kind of like the Barbie doll dress up. Like, this is my child. I get to dress them up in pretty clothes. And people do that all the time. Like, Jeff, you, you, have, you have very young kids uh, and, and a wife at home. How much does her face brighten up when she gets to put a new outfit on her, on her kids? When, when we found out that uh, our second, uh, second child was, was uh, to be a girl, my wife was so excited because the first, first child's a boy and she... She was immediately talking about, I'm going to get her these dresses. I'm going to do this and that. So now every time that somebody, uh, like I have an older sister who has a child that's uh, a girl that's that's a little bit older, she would give us hand-me-down stuff. So every time she would give us some stuff, you know, I would say, oh, yeah, my wife's going to be so excited about these. And and they'd be like, not not our daughter. My wife's going to be so excited about these because of the dress-up factor. Right. There is a dress-up factor. Looking cute. You know? yeah. yeah. So I think with the pageant stuff... For people who are on the inside, there's there's not this, we're trying to sexualize the kids. And they understand that in the pageant circuit. But again, from from the outside perspective, a lot of people see it as, you're making these kids look sexy. And that's just creepy. Yeah, it, it's, it's definitely, um, I mean, I know there's people who have, have trouble with the gymnastics, right? And, and that's, you know, that's simply working out, becoming physically, I mean, I'm simply, but I'm sure it's very difficult, but, but it's confined to gymnastics to the rings and the beam and the vault and all the other things the, the floor exercises all those things they do and there have been you know not a few people who suggested that some of the parents of those athletes especially the ones who start really young are trying to live vicariously through their child and it kind of seems obvious that they are in some cases yeah and with patsy ramsey i think there may have been a bit of that i mean she had been in the pageant life herself but she'd gone through a bout of cancer and had survived it, thankfully for her. She survived it, but she wasn't able to participate herself anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think that it was very shortly after, after that that she started entering Jean Benet in, in these things. Now, from what I've heard from her, her father in some of the interviews, she, Jean Benet took to it and loved it. She really liked doing it, which was very personable and very, very much enjoyed it, and especially when she would win. Like she would, 
like go over and give medals to to her father. He's like, look, I won this for you. And uh, so it's very, very cute and adorable kind of kind of thing. She liked it at the time. Now, whether she would have continued to like it at 8, 9, 10, 15, I don't know. And yeah. we'll never know. Well, that's the other issue that, that I wanted to get to with this is that I think one of the difficulties with starting this young is there's a lot of investment, not just financial, but I think, again, the vicarious thrill, the parents are like, oh, you're going you're gonna to do what I couldn't, or you're going to rival my experience. What if the child doesn't want to? I think there's a lot of pressure, like in gymnastics, again, go back to that example, we know there's a tremendous amount of pressure to work through the injuries, to work through the soreness, the horrible schedule, no friends, school and practice, that's all they get. And, you know, maybe, maybe they're grateful for that later. I mean, when they, or for the very few that win an Olympic medal, I'm sure that's incredible, yeah. incredible experience. But there's also a lot of pain and there's a lot of failure. Like most gymnasts are not successful just because that's how sports work. That is how sports work. Yeah. I mean, they're good, but, you know, to win a gold medal or, or even a silver or bronze is very difficult to do. Right. So, yeah, I mean, maybe free will gets a little bit crushed in some of these. Uh, like, like, it strikes me as... But, it, but at, the, at the time in 1996, Jean Monnet enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have the, all, most of the pictures that are in the media are pictures or, or videos that we see in documentaries are from her time in the, in the pageants. There are, very, there are a few, but very few candidates that we see from when they're at home and she's not performing. Did you guys see any video of Patsy uh, being the pageant mom? I didn't. I didn't get a chance to see him either. I, I looked very briefly, but I, I really didn't find anything. I had heard somebody say that there were videos that came out uh, at the time of this in the mid '90s of of Patsy being the pageant mom, just you know, kind of being um, uh, kind of angry, perhaps about it, or maybe even yelling. I didn't see them, but I just heard about them, and so I'm curious. Maybe you know, if anybody's out there and heard uh, saw these videos, or you know, if you can put a link or something. Um, but if that's true, that was probably kind of used against her, uh, much to your point, Dr. Grande, of maybe she didn't actually want this, or maybe she was, maybe Patsy was being overbearing. So I'm curious if any, anything like that actually exists. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not aware of it. Um, that would be interesting if she was kind of overbearing. You know, it definitely speaks to that control element, right? Right, which is, uh, well, maybe, maybe relevant in the case. It's you know, a lot to talk about that, but so. At this point, the police are there, and we see, again, John, Patsy, and Burke. Uh, Jean Benet, no one really even looks for her at this point, which also strikes me as a bit unusual. But again, we could say, as you mentioned, Mike, these police were not, you know, their, their kidnapping training was kidnapping bad, not kidnapping good. Yeah. Right? That's where they were in terms of... <laughs> the guy who knew more than that was in Miami or something. <laughs> and he was sunning himself somewhere, unaware that any of this was going on at the time. And from what I understand, before the police phone call was made, Patsy did check Chambonet's room. They tried to check the house. That's why she says on the 911 call, you know, she's not here. Mm -hmm. She knew. It wasn't just that she read, I read this note and take it face, face value and just, oh, she's not here. Apparently she read it and ran, ran upstairs to check. Right. And, and, and Burke, Burke will little say bit. later too that he got woken up by her running frantically, you know, where's John Bonnet? I can't find John Bonnet. Yeah. So apparently there was some cursory examination by the family of the home, including uh, portions of the basement. But nothing was found when they didn't see anything obvious and immediate. They called the police. The police arrived and then... Yeah, to you, your point, you would, they, you would they, that, they didn't do a thorough search of the house at that point. You would think that would be right near the top of the list. Now, I'm not a kidnapping expert or anything, but you would think that just make sure, just let's just make sure that she's not right here before we call the FBI or whatever, right? Like just because she may be playing downstairs or something, you know? I, I had heard that it was, I got conflicting things, but either a, an officer or a detective or somebody, or it was a family friend had went down to... Um, to the door of that room where Jean Monnet was later found uh, and didn't go into the door because they right. were looking for a possible exit for right. uh, at that point a potential right. no, uh, actually for, from from one of the uh, documentaries that I reviewed they actually said that they uh, shortly after that the um, crime scene investigators were there to take pictures and dust for prints on the on the thing and they took pictures of like every room in the house they even went down to the basement took pictures of the door in the basement to what they called the wine cellar, mm -hmm. but nobody opened that door. 
nobody opened that door. And then they went back upstairs and... Yeah. Well, opening doors is on day two of kidnapping. <laughs> yes. Apparently. Yeah. Oh, is that what that does? I turn it... <laughs> Yeah. It apparently had some kind of a um, piece of wood over it or something. I don't think it was just a doorknob. I remember seeing somebody lifting up a, uh, like some kind of latch or a piece of wood or something. So it was kind of abnormal in that way. Um, I don't know. I couldn't really figure out why I would have something like that. Um, in a basement. As opposed to just a doorknob. It's an interior know. door, right? Right. I mean, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yes. Well, it was, it was a... Um, a jump, I call it. It was a, a, a coal storage uh, place. The the house apparently had originally been built for to be coal heated, so that was the the coal storage room. And they colloquially called it the wine cellar. Yeah. But they didn't really keep much in there. Like it was just stuff that they put off to the side. Right. And so, like I can understand why there might not have been a traditional door on it. Yeah. Perhaps. Yeah, maybe to hold back weight. Like yeah. anthracite, whatever they dump into. Right. The- if if there's a huge amount of coal in there, you don't want to have just a small doorknob holding it. So you have a, a wood slat that keeps it closed to hold the weight. You ever hear stories from people who lived in houses that are like you have coal and also anthracite is like uh, in like this area, the anthracite, like um, who who went through the winter with those with those uh, coal furnaces. Like my dad lived in one right before the worm, right before there was a worm that, that churned it and brought the anthracite in. You had to go down like every hour and and shoveled into the furnace. You know, like yeah, it was like a lot of work. Like my dad has told me stories. The house he grew up in was exactly that way. He he, he that was his job when he was like six years old. Right? It's always the it's go always down, the shovel a couple of things in there, and that's like, not for safe. I'm huh? like. <laughs> right. Big, it's like, can't we furnace. get an auger? Can't we get an auger for this? Shut up, do your job. <laughs> <laughs> Keep shoveling. I think mean, that was back in the you know late late fifties, early sixties. So I mean, we had a, a wood stove that heated our house growing up. My parents still use it exclusively. I've got one house. too. Um, and so it's the same thing. You wake up in the morning and you're like, well, if you want to be warm, you're gonna have to go at that point start restart the fire if there's not enough coals. Yeah. And you know. I, I look back on that. I'm like, yeah, it wasn't so bad. It felt terrible then. We'd have to split wood during the summer and so forth. And whole wood I, shed. I loved it. I loved having a, a wood stove. I still love having a wood stove. I haven't used it in a while, but yeah. I still love having it. Yeah. So it's uh, you know it's a different way of living for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now I just touch the thermostat if I you know, but well, yeah, now I feel lazy. That's but, the easy way. Yeah. <laughs> now, now I can. Now I just bring up my phone and just tell the thermostat <laughs> remotely. And now I complain if it doesn't turn off fast enough when I hit. <laughs> yeah. Because then we get horrible sound over this over these videos. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Background noise. Um, all right. So again, at this point, the police are there, and we see this is important. The the ransom note, which we'll go over here in a minute. Uh, this was written to John Ramsey, addressed okay. to Mister Ramsey. Right. Yeah. The, who is the, the intended recipient, ostensibly? And it specified that kidnappers would call between eight and ten, uh, looking for their ransom demand of one hundred eighteen thousand dollars. Would which happens to be very close to what John had earned as a bonus the year before, as I understand it, at his work. And only certain people would know that information. That's a, you know, it, they didn't say like quarter million, 100,000, 118. That's pretty specific. So specific and probably shooting very low compared to, I guess, what you could potentially get. You know, you probably ask for 500,000 or a million or something. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what may, the norm is for. Maybe it was they were calculating for exchange, right? They were intending on taking this American money and making it like British pounds or something. So they're adding <laughs> the exchange rate on top of it. Right, the foreign they, faction. They want to get about. they want to get hundred thousand British pounds, but they can't ask for a hundred thousand American because it won't trans uh, translate. So one hundred eighteen thousand because that'll translate because the exchange rate is a, is you know dollar eighteen per pound. Big. So. I don't know. There's maybe 18, there's some logic in it. Maybe there's an eighteen thousand dollar kidnap fee that they're incorporating. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You know, there's a hundred thousand dollars, and then on top of that, there's the eighteen thousand dollar kidnapping fee that we're going to try. <laughs> Those notes don't write themselves. Right? Yeah, the no, right. Money makes the world go round. So the call never came in. Not between eight and ten. Not ever. Ever. No. Not ever. So the police, you know, they had cordoned off John Bidet's bedroom, but they did not search the house. It wasn't until seven hours later when the police asked John Ramsey and one of his neighbors who came over again, somebody who you know, I'm thinking probably should not have been there, right? Because that's a crime scene. I think at that point there were like 19 or 20 of the Ramsey's friends or family like there. Including and, the priest, I think. 
Yeah, and, and the pastor, maybe. most of the police had left. There was only one police officer, one of the detectives, right. who was left at the house. Very little experience, my understanding. She had very little right. experience. And I think that the 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 claim that's been made by, by John, and I think by that same detective, was that John was very agitated at that point. Like, nothing was happening. He was very upset, very agitated, was kind of pacing around with nothing to do. And she said to give him something to do to focus that nervous energy, why don't you go check the house, top to bottom? Just check every room, see if there's anything out of place that you can think of at all. So he and, he and the neighbor did. Yeah, so he, he apparently went directly, according to the police, went directly to the basement and came up from the basement carrying Jamine Ramsey's dead body, saying he found her behind a latch door going to a rarely used room, the one we talked about that was likely for The home. wine cellar. Yeah, so the crime scene there, the where the body was, yeah, it's very important not to touch that. Um, and you know, a lot of evidence probably lost right there. Uh, so you, know, you have to really blame the police for that one, though. I mean, okay. telling him to go look, I mean, he's not an expert. He sees a body, he thinks maybe she's alive. or sure. Yeah, if one of the investigators had opened that up and found it, the whole thing might have been different. Mm -hmm. They might have found a whole di bunch of different evidences. When... when John was apparently down there. He saw her. She had duct tape over her mouth. He pulled the tape off and tried to undo the bond, uh, the uh, binds on her the wrist, rope, yeah. the rope on her wrist. And, uh, and wasn't that, able to. And that's when he picked her up and carried her upstairs. Yeah, so cord wrapped around her wrist and neck, and it appeared she'd been strangled with something referred to as a garrote, which we see every now and then in cases it's not very common but it's but it, brutal yeah well you know it, it basically uh, uh i think this was what was the was this a drumstick or something it was a a, a paintbrush a handle paintbrush. It was a paintbrush handle. broken off yeah. what about from patsy's uh, yeah. art supply mm -hmm. kit or, or supplies that's right yeah. and a, a garot or a garrote is any kind of ligature that has a uh, a leveraging unit right a, a, a stick stuck in a loop that is twisted to be tightened or used as handles and pulled mm -hmm. but it has something that gives the ligature more leverage yes and, and you look at pictures of that after the you know the police took i guess <clears throat> and you could see just how tight that was around her neck uh, even if uh, like even after she was brought upstairs uh, you could still see how tight it was so somebody had really really taken some some energy some force to do that yeah, so brutal, you know, brutal homicide. So now, not a kidnapping. Uh, they know it's a homicide, and the crime scene is contaminated. The whole house is contaminated. Oh, and she, Mr. Jamine had a um, very severe uh, <clears throat> fracture in her skull, too. Yeah. Um, you see, we can see the right. pictures of the uh, x-rays. It's like, I think, right down the middle, if, if I'm seeing it correctly. And I had heard that there was no, that the skin was not broken. Um, maybe some bruising or something, but there was no, the skin was not broken, so it had to have been some kind of blunt object, it, not it, a sharp yeah. one. Uh, the, the colloquial wisdom with investigators is, is with blunt force trauma stuff, you get the first one for free. There's very, very rarely a uh, breach of the skin from a, a truly blunt object hitting the head. It's usually the second one or the third one that, that pulls or rips. Um, but if there's a sharp side to it, it's going to, it's going to tear immediately. Sure. But yeah, there, I, her the the scalp was intact. Yeah, yeah, brutal uh, skull fracture and strangulation, cause of death. They they put both of them on there. Yeah. So um, they couldn't determine which one came first. Is, is what I had heard from a uh, um, somebody that investigated did the um, yeah investigated it. Uh, they couldn't determine which one had come first. Yeah, there's the. Um, I think the term they use is perimortem, like all around the time of death. So both of them happened within a short period of time prior to her death, and they, they couldn't determine which order that they came in. And I did see, too, that when she had been brought up from that from the basement, uh, what's the term, rigor mortis, I think, mm -hmm. that, that her body was stiff, indicating that she had been uh, dead for at least um, one place that I read at least four hours. So at least four plus hours, maybe maybe more. Um, so indicating around the time of death would have been 
close to the day before, and maybe they'd figured out it was the day before. I'm not sure. Yeah, because they had waited seven just since the phone call right. at that point, right? So, yeah. So here we are. I mean, this it was January 1997, a month later, when they uh, determined the cause of death. We, we go all the way to April to see the police interview John and Patsy. It takes a long time. Uh, well, they were still going over the note. Uh, apparently, the police were still reading it. <laughs> it's, it's an extensive note. Well, that's, actually, that's, that's probably a good time. It's three pages long. Should we read it? <laughs> and, let's, let's take a look at the note And apparently... Now. The, they, they, the kidnapping person finally came back and had to read it. <laughs> Give some context. Right. <laughs> right. So, so this, uh, you'll read this, Jeff, for us. But yeah. this note was, um, it seems to be written on stationery that was in the house with a pen that was also in the house. So this wasn't uh, brought into the house. It was actually written there. Yeah. We don't know if it was crafted there. Maybe somebody had it in their head or, or transferred or whatever. But... It was written. Somebody took the time. And, and we know that it was written there because the pad was there and it had indentations from the, impression. the writing right. impressions on the, the pages that were still on the pad. From a pen that was reportedly Patsy's right. pen or, or it, you know, it was in the house already. Yeah, and, and when, you, when you look at the different investigators, uh, which is, what you see here is the same thing. All of them pretty much say something to the effect of they have never seen a ransom note like that in all the cases they've ever worked. It's just never seen it. So there's no baseline. There's no way to compare and say, well, this is, this is pretty close to one I've seen. It's just awkward. Yeah. It, it wasn't cut out of newspaper print. <laughs> you know, we've seen in, in other movies, although apparently that is a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, investigators have said that statistically speaking, it's more likely to be a woman who does that than a man. How about that? Yeah, it was, that's in every... The, the, in colla every, the uh, collage ransom note. Yeah, it's in every older movie, like, uh, say, well, not even older, maybe 80s, 90s, like crime movies. There's there's always those letters, like they're always twisted a little when you go for it, and different sizes. Wasn't right. that the way the, the note in Ransom was, the movie Ransom? <laughs> which which actually came out in 1996 over the summer. So it was like, it was a big blockbuster. Mel Gibson at the time. Was that was, Gary Sinise too? I, th I think so. Gary Sinise was in it, Mel Gibson. Yeah. Uh, Mel Gibson was a big, draw, a bigger draw at that time. Well, at <laughs> at that time. time. Yeah. Um, but you know, Mel Gibson, huge star at that point, hadn't gone on any racist rants at that point in his career. So really big time name. Um, big movie about a kidnapping and ransom. Mel Gibson's interesting because he, he's also in a movie about conspiracy theories. Called Conspiracy Theory. Right, which was, yeah, so he, he kind of he runs around all the bases for our, <laughs> our podcast. Very original <laughs> movie titles, too. Ransom, yeah. conspiracy theory. <laughs> right. movie, come? movie about crime. That is Le the title. Lethal weapon. <laughs> What's the next one going to be? Like one through four. This guy killed this guy. That will be the next one. Braveheart. <laughs> Braveheart. Look at my heart. It's brave. Braveheart is a pretty good movie, but I don't think it was completely historically accurate. It was not. Yeah, that's the not movie. at all. But a great, a great, it's great movie. movie. Great movie. Very, very inspiring, passionate movie. I love that movie when I, after it came out. Not. It's historically accurate. I think, you know, if you look back at The Road Warrior, I'd have to say um, the I think number two. Sequel. I think uh, I think number two was the, was, uh, what was the name of the number? Oh, Mad, Max. Mad Max. Mad Max. Road Warrior was the first one, Mad right. Max, and then Mad Max Beyond the Thunderdome. Yeah, that one wasn't so good. But I like I liked the second one a lot with Mad the with the truck, with the diesel, and he had the, that was great. Yeah. yeah. With the last of the V8 interceptors. <laughs> <laughs> great. <clears throat> Great classic Australian movies, things that brought Mel Gibson actually on, onto the stage. But Ransom was big in 1996. It was a huge blockbuster at the time. And it was, you know, person kidnapped a very wealthy person's child. And it's worth noting, this, this occurred in December of 96 when that movie already would have been out. Yeah, it came out over the summer. And so it would have been, it was a huge thing that year. And this uh, event with, with uh, Jean Benet happened in, you know, as we said, December 26th. So... Just about everybody in the country would have been aware of the movie at that point. All right, but, so let's uh, let's hear this uh, this note. We'll interrupt you a few times here, but probably let's hear, let's hear the mysterious notes. All right, so this is a three-page, two and a half-page ransom note. It starts out, Mr. Ramsey, listen carefully. We are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. We, and then there's two letters that are indistinguishable that are xed out. We respect your business, but not the country that it serves. At this time, we have your daughter in our possession. 
She is safe and unharmed, and if you want her to see 1997, you must follow our instructions to the letter. Uh, at this point, um, another paragraph, at least. I don't have it. I'm not looking at a copy of it, um, but it might be another just paragraph. We will withdraw $118,000 from your account. I'm sorry, you will withdraw $118,000 from your account. $100,000 will be in $100 bills and the remaining $18,000 in $20 bills. Make sure that you bring an adequate size attache to the bank. When you get home, you will put the money in a brown paper bag. I will call you between 8 and 10 a.m. tomorrow to instruct you on delivery. The delivery will be exhausting, so I advise you to be rested. If we monitor you getting the money early, we might call you early to arrange an earlier delivery of the money and hence a, a earlier, and then they have the word delivery crossed out, pickup of your daughter. Any deviation of my instructions will, and they say my instructions, not our, because this, this is a faction. Any deviation of my instructions will result in the immediate execution of your daughter. You will also be denied her remains for proper burial. The two gentlemen watching over your daughter do not particularly like you, so I advise you to not provoke them. I, provi I advise you not to provoke them. Speaking to anyone about your situation, such as police, FBI, etc., will result in your daughter being beheaded. If we catch you talking to a stray dog, she dies. If you alert bank authorities, she dies. If the money is in any way marked or tampered with, she dies. You will be scanned for electronic devices and... If any are found, she dies. You can try to deceive us, but be warned that we are familiar with law enforcement countermeasures and tactics. You stand a 99% chance of killing your daughter if you try to outsmart us. Follow our instructions and you stand a 100% chance of getting her back. You and your family are under constant scrutiny as well as the authorities. Don't try to grow a brain, John. You are not the only fat cat around, so don't think that killing will be difficult. Don't underestimate us, John. Use that good southern common sense of yours. It is up to you now, John. Victory, exclamation mark, SBTC. Yeah, very, very peculiar note, right? There's, there's a few things, or there's a lot of thing, things about it. We talked about the 118 matching the bonus. Right, and the, the, the 18,000 being in 20s does speak to the... You know, kidnapping charge. Mm -hmm. The kidnapping fee. That they, yeah. <laughs> what I think is interesting is the 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 misunderstanding of how much space a hundred thousand dollars in hundred dollar bills takes up. Well, they said adequate size. Maybe they meant like make, it, make an adequate size. No, the, the problem is like you wouldn't need an adequate size attaché because any attaché would work because it'd be approximately five inches tall, like a stack of a hundred. They come, you know, a stack of a hundred hundred dollar bills, it's half an inch thick. You know, what this reminds me of. It was a movie with uh, Mike Myers. You'd need 10 of them. They'd be five inches. Where he plays uh, a British... Uh, there's three movies, I think. He plays Austin like Powers. British, uh, Austin Powers. And when he's playing the other character, he plays several other characters, Dr. Evil, something happened when he goes through time, whatever. He doesn't understand the value of money. <laughs> and he demands an amount of money that's way too $100,000. <laughs> <laughs> then everybody laughs at him. <laughs> and then, the, then when he comes back, it's like... A billion zillion or something. <laughs> he overcorrects. He's like overcorrects goes way up to the other side. The, the, the speaking of movies that that speak to the point. There's a movie called Dodgeball. Mm -hmm. One, of, it's a it's a great movie. One of my favorites. But there's a scene where um, Ben Stiller's character, the evil the evil villain of the movie, you know, has this this briefcase and he's offering the the good guy. He's like, I'll give you a hundred thousand dollars to sign yourself over. And he opens up the briefcase. It's just tiny stack of money. He's like. <laughs> Hundred thousand dollars kind of lose something in translation, doesn't it? <laughs> like, it's like that's that's what I envision when we, when I hear that. Like, like, make sure you bring an adequate size attaché. And of course, I know they're also talking about well, eighteen thousand dollars in twenties. That would only be six stacks of twenties. That's less than five inches. You could put them all together and have you know maybe ten inches tall. Like it stands this tall. A big Manila envelope like, would have been. Yeah, yeah, you could put it all in a big Manila envelope. Like it's really. I think really underestimating or overestimating how much space that takes up. It's not yeah. like we're talking about a million dollars, which would be, you know, 50 inches tall. I got to say, I've seen all four of the movies that you guys have mentioned. Yes. This is a first. That's a first. <laughs> this is a first. <laughs> Great. I'm sure we'll mention another movie that Jeff hasn't seen before we're and done. And I'll sit, I'll shrink back here and say, <laughs> don't, don't mention it.
I think my favorite scenes in the Austin Powers movie has to be with Dr. Evil and his kid. I forget the... Oh, yeah. Scott. Seth, uh, Seth, Scott. Seth Green. Seth, Seth Green, Green. Right. Played it's, Scott, it's Scott like, Evil. It's great casting stuff because like he's doing everything <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Can I have a hug? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So in the note, we do see apparent references to Dirty Harry, uh, played by Clint Eastwood, and the movie Speed, a very popular movie with Keanu Reeves and Sandra Bullock, I believe, yep. uh, and Dennis Hopper. So the movie posters for those films were in the house. Now, again, a kidnapper could have come in and seen the posters and thought, well, I'll try to speak in a way that matches their culture. Just trying to be appropriate. You know, like, I'll use references they understand. No, also a reference to the movie Ransom. Right. Oh, but I don't think there was a poster for Ransom. I don't think there was a poster for Ransom, yeah. but, but definitely there was posters for Speed and Dirty Harry. But as we know, there are many people who have a lot of movie knowledge and use those terms regularly. <laughs> I didn't write the note. I was 15 at the time and in America and uh, on the wrong coast. Like, it wasn't me. I don't know about that, Mike. Now you're a suspect. <laughs> I might have to sue somebody. <laughs> so, uh, so with this note, you have, you have somebody who is in the, in the commission of, even if they just believe it was a kidnapping and they decide to kill Jean-Marie later, in the commission of a felony that's going to get them you know, 20 years 15, 20 years, like no matter how it, it plays out. And they're like, you know what? Let me write this long handwritten note and politely explain all the conditions and criteria in detail. Seem, you know, it seems like they're, they're an expert kidnapper enough to get in the house, not, not have to break their way in, all the stuff they've never, they've never been caught. Yet they're not smart enough to bring the note with them. Or even just be straightforward about it. Yeah. You know, I want this money. Bullet points. Give it back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, an outline would have done. <laughs> so, yeah, so the timing doesn't work. And then we get to, like, the handwriting experts. Now, I'll use the air quotes. Experts. Right. So everybody and their brother declared themselves a handwriting expert and said that apparently that most of them took the side that Patsy Ramsey <clears throat> did not write the note. Which I find odd. You'd think they would suspect her just because they don't know what they're doing and they're trying to cause trouble, you know. Right. But I think they most of them work to say she didn't write it. Well, handwriting analysis is hogwash. It has no scientific basis at all. I had heard at the very least that uh, at least some people did not uh, thought it was similar enough, perhaps, or, or, or couldn't exclude her. As a possibility for having written it based on handwriting analysis, there were some, there were some who even said that she did. Right. You know, like okay, we, I've got two hundred different examples of the letter C that has the same little kind of that, that I see in, in her writing and everything. But the, the actual analysis is terrible, especially since in some cases they make uh, make a person write exactly what was written in the note mm -hmm. and try and say make it look this way. <laughs> Yeah, not not good science. Yeah. So but there's all sorts of you know things like hesitation marks and things. I have hesitation marks in my own writing when I know what I'm writing, mm -hmm. because I'll forget what oh, how a word is spelled and I'll hesitate and then I'll continue moving. Doesn't mean that I didn't write the thing I wrote. So many people believe that uh, that Patsy did write this note. Just some people mm -hmm. it's very obvious, like oh yeah, clearly clearly she did. I'm not sure if she did, but I think. She did. I, I, th I think it's. I think it's more likely she did. My opinion. There's obviously a lot of odd things in here. The word choice. Um, the fact that there was only uh, two spots where words were crossed out. So when I write, I'm crossing out many things because I make a mistake or whatever. This tells me that maybe the person already had in their mind what they were going to write. Maybe they're just a better writer than I am. I don't know. Um, but the word choice. Uh, the familiarity with the family, right. the dollar amounts, the culture, the whatever else, the movies and all that. So, yeah, there's definitely a lot of odd things that, that really point to either someone in that house or someone very close to them. I'll agree that, that it is a little odd that there's only like two things crossed out in general because right when I write something handwritten, I'm t constantly crossing things in out. Ink, no it, less. Yeah, in ink. But I, I, and I'm way worse when it comes to typing. Like, I... I make so many mistakes when typing, but I have, I have once written an entire document 
in ink without crossing out anything. Wow. It's an amazing accomplishment. I've only done it once in my life. Did you submit it for publishing? Because I think it's that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I framed it and put it up in the house. But the it, is, it is possible for someone to, uh, to, to do that. Right. But very unusual to, to even cross things out. Because very often, especially as early in the, in the letter as that first thing is crossed out, you have a pad of paper you're writing on. You can just rip that off after the first sentence. You go, nope, not good enough. I would do that. Mm -hmm. Most, I think most people would, but they're just like, yeah, cross it off and continue writing. Continue going. They've already left yeah. enough. Uh, evident, like, you know, they're using the pad of paper in the house. Why not just start a new one and you know, say, oh, this is my first draft. And then. Yeah. I got my first draft over here. Maybe this is the first draft and they were intending on editing, but then. There was they... some speculation on that. I heard At the end, it says SBTC, but there's not a period after the C. So some people would speculate, had speculated because the period's not there, maybe they intended to write more or something. Who knows? In, in images, it's a little spotty, though, because it could be that the that, that period is part of the C. Sure. I guess you finish and, and dot. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't seem that there's a, a difference. And some of the images I, that you can look at in close up, it does look like there's some pixelation that looks like it could be a dot that's conjoined with the C. So you don't know. It, yeah. right. now, it is weird. Fingerprints were recovered on this note. Other than the police, they only matched one person, Batsy Ramsey. Go figure. Now, she had a, an excuse. like She, she picked, picked it, it up. So, yeah. so if the kidnapper was wearing gloves, then that would all match. And I, I don't know. I don't know whether she read it, wrote it or not. And, and I, I, don't, I don't like to think that she did. Just because there's so much. And I think that... Um, one of the other investigators who become very important, Lou Smith, mm -hmm. made made a point that there's so many uses of the word "die" and "death." Like we're going to behead her. Right. We're going to she she dies. She dies. She dies. She dies. Said so many times, and it, it just it strikes me as just too difficult for a mother to write that about their child. From from just from the psychological standpoint, I don't think I don't think it strikes me as, as something that she she would or could have done. Uh, in that in that sense, yeah, yeah, it's definitely up in the air. I mean, but just like in terms of probability, I I, I tend to think it's a little more likely than not. But yeah, it very well could have been someone else who you know maybe they wrote it, maybe the person wrote it before they became involved in the kidnapping, like they they burglarized the house. They wrote the note, and then they decided to, to move forward. Uh, because, you know, the other thing is you're not going to get a ransom if you kill the victim. Right? So they killed the victim. Right? So, right. So, so why didn't they, like, why would you leave the evidence at that point? You, you would at least retrieve the note. Right. <laughs> like, you, you killed the victim. You don't want to take the victim's body. <clears throat> okay. Uh, that's taking a chance, too. But then you would, you would certainly get the note. And the pad you wrote it on and the pen. There's another really off the wall possibility I mean, like being movie buffs and things maybe this was a a, a writing exercise you know, the potential that the somebody was writing this if it was patsy maybe she wrote this because it never says i don't believe it, it doesn't say john benet I was just you know, it just says just your says daughter so right. mr ramsey at the top but then everything else is just kind of generic as, as far as it goes. I mean, the $118,000, yeah, sure. Maybe if, if you're really into writing, I've done writing exercises in, in, about movies and stuff. If, if Ransom was becoming a big influence, maybe Patsy did write something like this, or maybe she wrote this as part of uh, a writing exercise if she's involved in, in this all, all. And she had put it aside, put it away. And then if, this is all just speculation and profit, right. if, if she was involved in it, she pulls it out to try and cover up. It's something she wrote months ago and pulls it out. Or maybe it's something somebody else wrote months ago in the same vein and they pulled out, which is why there's kind of the movie references throughout it. Yeah. It's yeah, so, so in that line of thinking, in terms of a really unusual conclusion, although I think any, you know, whatever happened was unusual. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the problem in this case. I wonder if an intruder did kidnap or try to kidnap and murder Jean Benet and Patsy wrote the note. I mean, she's into... Uh, appearances, you know, in, in terms of like attention, oh, say attention seeking, but, you know, likes attention, like with the pageants and stuff. Maybe this was, 
like, hey, I'll, I'll double down on all this excitement and I'll write a note. I mean, I don't know why anyone would do that because they're committing a crime, right? Because she's saying the note, she found it, you know. It's a strange move. But if somebody was really into like, oh yeah, Patsy wrote the note, but they're also into the intruder theory, that's the only way those two go together unless it was a conspiracy. Unless there, you know, I can see another, uh, speaking to that point, if there was another note that was much shorter, sorry, I killed your daughter, and that was left, and she found that, freaks out about it, writes this note to try and cover, mm-hmm. to because she doesn't know where, what's going on. I, and I can't speak to the mindset of a person who's just found out that their daughter is dead, mm-hmm. if that's the case. Or I'm not saying it is. At least, yeah. I'm not saying it is. It's entirely possible that somebody else did write this note, brought it in, was just brazenly walking around the Ramsey house while they were asleep, decided to take 20, 25 minutes, half an hour maybe, to write this long, really long note, and then you know, do some of the other things that, that are speculated on, and then murdered a child. Like that, if, if somebody's brazen enough to walk into a house and murder a child, sitting around writing a note is not going to be beyond their ability to do so. Yeah. Well, you know, maybe drugs were involved. It's possible. One of the words in here that uh, that John Bonet was questioned, I'm sorry, that uh, Patsy was questioned on, uh, it's in the second paragraph. It says, um, uh, early, earlier delivery of the money and hence a earlier pickup of your daughter. And apparently Patsy used the word hence. Uh, I don't know about often, but it, she at least used it. It was it was kind of verified by by people, and so the people questioning her about it. And it might have just been the public for all I know, but uh, they said that's yeah, not a very common word. Not a lot of people use hence, mm-hmm. and that was their way of connecting her to this ransom note. Um, I disagree. Well, and so <laughs> and so that brings up the point: How do you defend your language that you use, right? Because there's words that I'm sure we all say that are not common necessarily, but it's words that we use regularly. And so how are you going to go ahead and defend the word choice that you use when it's just common for you? And, you know, like, I use the word hence. Like, they used it too. They're both words. You're right. We both use words. Mm -hmm. But how do you defend your word choice? It's got to be like... By by that logic, we can go and say, listen carefully. Right. You've used that before, Mike. (laughs) She... She said, listen carefully before. That means she must have written a note. It, like, right. Words like hence, actually fairly common word. Uh, in certain circles, you might not hear it. In other circles, you hear it a lot. Sure. Right. Right. So kind of looking at a few other things with, um, on the, so the two theories come down to, you know, Ramsey theory and Truder theory, right? Uh, obviously, uh, someone killed Jean Monnet. Uh, it's, the police ruled out. Burke completely. He's, he's never been a suspect. Um, I, I'm pretty sure he, he was not involved in any way. He was nine years old. So it's, I don't know. I've seen some TV shows where the nine year old, the last one you'd expect could have been the person. <laughs> and I know the tabloids did suspect that at a the time. They're, yeah. There was a whole just... theory with the pineapple and, and all that, like, cause his fingerprints were on a pineapple bowl right. and pineapples found in her stomach. So something happened with the pineapple and hit her or whatever. But there's, there's really, there's really no evidence to support that. I mean, yes, there have been killers that young, but I'd be very surprised. So, you know, I think it really comes down to Patsy, Patsy or John, you know, whatever, whoever were an intruder. And there, there were like 1,600 people that the police looked into. So there could be, I mean, there's any number of possible intruders. The intruder theory, I think, is a valid theory. But kind of looking at the Ramseys for a little bit longer... We see that when the when ten o'clock passed, right, it was eight to ten was the window that was specified in the note. They didn't say anything. They didn't do anything, according to the police. Like you would think that you'd be really scared. Like when that ten o'clock, like are they going to call? Is this normal? No, no reaction whatsoever. Kind of like maybe they knew that no one was going to be calling. Right. So back back to to Burke. There was there was a. TV show on a few years ago called Secrets and Lies, uh, starring Ryan Felipe. It was actually a Delaware resident or a Delaware native came came from here. Uh, it was a really good show. Keeps you. It's really gripping. If you haven't seen it, I, I, su- I suggest watching it. It's all fictional, but the 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 spoiler alert: the person who did it is actually his daughter, like, and is uh, very young. She's like you know eight or nine years old herself, 
And like that to me, like speaks to if Burke had done it, if Burke did all of that and they found out and uh, they didn't, they wanted to hide it. That would be a reason why she might write the ransom note. Right. Hmm? Yeah. That's all supposition. I have no evidence beyond a TV show <laughs> to support any, anything to that. It's all just supposition, but it is an explanation. It's a potential hypothesis. But again, Burke's never been considered a suspect. No, not at any point during the entire yeah. investigation. I, th I think and it's um, another way to look at it, perhaps, is that <clears throat> her death could have been an accident, and that was what somebody's way of covering right. it up. You know, I, I mean, I think that's more likely than than Burke being the perpetrator. You know, a slip and fall. You know, the steps. There was multiple steps apparently down from the first level. Right. You know, Six-year-old trips running around, hits her head, and for whatever reason, the parents aren't satisfied to call the police or you know help, and they or she dies, and and they just think they're going to be charged. Right. So they do this whole thing. I don't know. The the one district attorney that that would later um, uh, quit because of you know frustrations with this. Essentially, uh, his theory was that she had. Um, I, I think he said it was intentional, but had somebody had slammed her head on a bathtub, side of a bathtub, um, and you know then went ahead and covered it up, or tried to cover it up. So yeah, it's you know whether accidental or on purpose. Uh, I'm sure there's uh, you know infinite number of ways this could have possibly happened. Whether it was the parents, son, uh, an intruder, um, it's. Uh, there's not a whole lot of evidence that really points definitively to, to anybody. No, like, I think if you look at the intruder theory, um, and, and again, you know, the, the note becomes a problem. Then you'd have to believe the intruder wrote the note, which, you know, who, who knows? Maybe they did. It, what I find strange, like, what, what, what supports the intruder theory is I find it strange that a mother and father would, would put together this conspiracy. Like, it seems like an odd conspiracy to construct. Like, you would think one would be like, Oh no, we're calling the police, even if the other one was interested in trying to hide it. Right. <clears throat> what I don't know is like in their marriage, was one of them like absolutely in charge? Like the dynamic. It's a good question. Yeah. There's also a footprint. There's a lot of disagreement about the footprint. Like, you know, all these different theories. But if the footprint is real, then that points toward an intruder and away from the Ramses. The windows were open. Several of the windows were open because they had Christmas lights. So they had the cord, which is a terrible idea. They run the cord through the window and, don't, right. and they can't close the window that's, all the way. That's never a good idea. Yeah, it's, you, you know, you might as well just put a burglarize my house sign. Up. Now, the, the dad had said that when they went to sleep, they set the alarm or that he set the alarm. So I'm curious how effective this alarm was and if it would be alerted to windows opening or if it was just uh, sensors, maybe sensing somebody moving around in there. So I'm curious what that would have looked like. Most, most of those alarm systems tend to use some sort of magnetic sensor on right. the windows. And you know, one, one of the windows that, that would specifically be a huge part of this case um, didn't have one of those sensors on it and it was broken. John had no, knew it was broken and he was he hadn't gotten it fixed yet. Yeah, but even if it had sensors on it, if there was a window that had a cord running through it, would it have been thick enough or open enough that that sensor wouldn't have caught to begin with? Potentially, even, even have set be able to set the alarm right. at that point. I don't Potentially. know. Potentially, I don't know. Right. So there's, I think that brings. Up I don't know. That, I don't know their alarm system. So exactly, and I've never installed system. one, so I don't know all that much about it. Certainly not on a yeah. six thousand square foot house. Yeah, no. well, I would think the I would think the extension cord would be thick enough to throw off some of those. It depends on how they're they're configured. Right. But you can put an exception, like don't arm that. Mm -hmm. You know. But again, you have the whole security system, and you're running electrical cords through the. Like, why would you do that? Yeah. Um, the security system may not even be doing anything at that point. Mm -hmm. Even arming it just doesn't do much because it's like error. Yeah. <laughs> So I want to get to the, the, the stun gun theory, but before I do that, I, I want to talk about the DNA because this, you know, this is the big support for the intruder theory. Now, Michael Bond, a very, very famous forensic pathologist. He was on HBO's Autopsy. He's been involved in, I don't even know how many high-profile <clears throat> high murders, tons, tons. And he's considered pretty good, right? Like he's considered an expert. 
And what he said about the DNA, there was DNA found on Jean Monnet that did not belong to anyone they could identify. He said that <clears throat> that can happen incidentally. Like there's no reason to believe that indicates an intruder or, you know, another person. Like it just doesn't. It's mm -hmm. you, you, we shed DNA all the time. But the intruder theory is, you know, that's, you know, people go right back to the DNA. I'm like, nope, nope, there was DNA. It's also a contaminated crime scene. Yeah. Well, I was, was going to say, do you, do you guys know, I, I wasn't able to find this anywhere. Do you know if they uh, tried to control for all the people that were in there? Like, did they have DNA samples of these, all the friends and family that were in there? From what I understand, they tried to get DNA samples from, and like hair samples from everyone they could that was, that had come into the household okay. that day. Um, and that, but they can't guarantee they got everybody. Oh, well, sure. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I wonder how much they controlled for things like that. To your point, Dr. Grande, of maybe it was just someone that happened to be in the house and they don't know that that, of that person, that person could have had DNA from somebody else on them for whatever reason that, that got on John Bonet somehow. Yeah. And I'm talking about an, an incredibly small amount. And where, and where it was located was, is where, what draws a lot of people into this, um, because one of the statements made by the autopsy was that that, that uh, sexual assault could not be ruled out right. in this case. But there was no evidence. There was no actual evidence of a conventional situation happening. So, But they couldn't rule it out. And some of that DNA was found on her underwear. Mm -hmm. So that's where they're like, did this happen? You know, it... Yeah. Yeah, the, D the DNA's... Yeah, DNA is tricky with this, and I, I think even though it is a small amount, it certainly does support the intruder theory. It's something that supports the intruder theory. Sure. Right? Uh, I don't think it's particularly strong, um, but it's it's something. And it's worth noting, too, that uh, there's disagreement about it, but John and, and Patsy were exonerated by by a district attorney. Yeah, because then, of the... What's that? Be because of the DNA. Like, yeah. They ran it, it didn't... Uh, in, what was it, 2006, 2008? Yeah, and some, like other, some other law enforcement said that, that they should not have been. Right. You know. um, but, but the, you know, I mean, take it, take it as it is, whatever that means. Uh, they, they were presumed to not be responsible, and you know, the DNA was the reason. And there are two other, other big pieces of evidence found with, on Sean Benet's body that were, that were worth, or one of them was actually in, and that was the um, pineapple. Uh, apparently, uh, she had there was pineapple found in her stomach that she'd eaten several hours before her death, uh, and both John and Patsy said they did not remember feeding her that that pineapple, like pineapples and milk, like put pineapples in a bowl and pour milk on. I've never eaten it that way. The investigators thought it was cereal at first, yeah, because they saw the milk and who puts fruit in right. You know? And and to a point you made earlier, like people were wiping down the the uh, the counters. Somebody cleaned up that bowl. Like they, they, you know, investigators saw it there, but somebody else picked it up, washed it and put it away. And that could have had, could have had fingerprints on it, could have had DNA on it, could have had, could have been the thing that broke the case, but it had gotten washed and put away. I thought I'd heard at some point that, that Burke's fingerprint was on the bowl of pineapple. Not, of course, that doesn't necessarily mean anything because he lived in the house. But I thought there was a report of the pineapple bowl of his fingerprint. Yeah, it might have been washed. Yeah, yeah, police reported they found uh, Burke's fingerprint on fingerprints on the bowl, um, but it, I think it was on the outside. Oh, so the inside had been washed. So the inside had been washed out. So the who knows outside how fingerprints might yeah. have been on there. Who knows what fingerprints were on the inside? And he lived in the house. Yeah, he's he probably good. used that bowl. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, yeah, it's like, not... I th I'm pretty sure that my fingerprints are on every single bowl in my cabinet because I use them all, or have been at some point. Like they go through the dishwasher, so. <laughs> so, yeah, so then now moving to the to the stun gun. And uh, before the recording, like we were talking about, like you had looked into this extensively with the, the stun gun. The stun and, gun, and, and which, the which was the other, which is the other piece of evidence found on Jean Benet's right. body. Two, two marks, right? Yeah. I, it's actually two sets of marks. There was a set of two marks on her shoulder up by her neck, and then two down on the lower back. Hmm. All right, so some people have said that, you know, the kidnapper must have used a stun gun and then uh, taken her down to the basement and killed her with a garrote. Right. But 
You had read something about an expert who disagreed. Yeah. So the, the the first person to float this particular hypothesis was a uh, uh, Lou Smith. He's an investigator who, very famous investigator, 200 plus convictions. Like he'd never failed to get a conviction when he was investigating homicides. Like never. Wow. 100% conviction rating on every investigation that he'd done. His uh, granddaughters, I think, ended up doing a podcast about John Benet, is my understanding. Yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's a wonderful, uh, I was just watching it today, wonderful documentary that was, uh, it's on the Investigative Discovery, I think. Um, I think it's called John Benet, What Really Happened actually has a lot of his personal recordings like he had a tape recording he he talked into to keep his notes for himself like he would just pick it up talk into it and so it's throughout this whole thing it's basically from his perspective about the investigation this whole case um and so the the idea that these were stun gun marks came from him like he he saw those marks and he said well i'm familiar with stun guns that, you know that's a stun gun and so he contacted um Air Taser, which is a manufacturer of stun guns and biggest manufacturer in the United States at the time. And uh, I mean, now, nowadays, uh, everybody and their brother makes a stun gun. Like, they're stun gun flashlights and, and, and little stun gun keychains. Uh, but Air Taser was the big marketer in, in 1996. So he, he called them, gave them dimensions, said, can you send me the one that matches this? And they sent him the closest one they could find. And what he did was he went and got a pig carcass and he took the stun gun and, you know, hit it, hit, hit the pig carcass several times with the stun gun and then looked at, examined the marks and said, these match exactly what's on Jean Benet. So these marks are definitely from a stun gun. So and this that, is important before you, before you continue with this. This is important because if a stun gun was used, that strongly points to the intruder theory because no stun gun was found. Right. Right. And the Ramses didn't own one. So there, there wasn't one that was, just, oh, he could have used it. You know, it was, the intruder would have had to have brought it, brought it with them. And taken it with them. And taken it with them when they left. But Lou Smith's uh, idea, this is where I have a problem with this. I had to look into it because every time I kept hearing this, it was, it was Lou Smith's uh, hypothesis from everybody, was that the intruder came in, went up to Jean Benet's bedroom, zapped her with the, the stun gun to incapacitate her, then picked her up, took her down to the basement which completely skips over the whole pineapple thing. Mm -hmm. Like, when did she eat the pineapple? But for, for Smitty, she, that could have been earlier in the evening. It could have been she snuck down and ate it herself. And returned to bed. And then returned to bed, which is possible because the bowl was left. It was reported that. that she didn't eat much at that party that they had been to, that they had come back home to. Right. So maybe, maybe she did go downstairs after they went to sleep and got something to eat. Who knows? It, it is possible. Yeah. It is possible. But... The, the, the idea, she, the, the intruder came in, used the stun gun to incapacitate her, then took her down to the basement and proceeded to uh, try and put her into a suitcase and take her out so that she wouldn't be seen, but the suitcase wouldn't fit through the window. And so then he was stuck and killed her there and escaped himself. The biggest, the thing that read, led me to look into this was that whole idea of the stun gun incapacitating the child. Is that's a Hollywood trope. Like that's a thing you see in the movies, even at the time. You know, you see the you know some you know, our hero, our Star Wars hero, standing there looking around a corner, and somebody comes up behind him, and and they're unconscious for several minutes to several hours. Right, they wake up depending a, on the switch. They wake up at some point. Oh, a warehouse. Yeah, somewhere. they wake up in a warehouse tied to a chair because they've been stun gunned. It doesn't happen that way in real life. I'll just put it out there. It doesn't happen that way in real life. You know, th this podcast is going to be on YouTube, so a lot of people are going to view it on YouTube. So once you're done watching this particular video, you can you know, go up to the search bar up there and look for stun gun reaction videos. Some of them are really funny. But none of them have the person being knocked unconscious. It's actually very painful to get hit by a stun gun. And I knew that, because I knew that that trope was a thing. Mm. And... So having looked at those, some of those videos, I said, wow, the idea of an intruder going into Jean Benet's room with a stun gun and hitting her with a stun gun, that would have woken up the entire house. The, the screams made by a six-year-old child who had just been hit by you know, a you know, 10 or 20 or 100,000 volt stun gun would have woken up the neighborhood. It would have been you know, nuclear screams going on. 
Yeah, and they're not necessarily quiet just in their operation. No, they're not. They make a very loud clicking, so like repeated clicking sound, because they're they're not actually a continuous flow of electricity. It's you know rapid, uh, short bursts. Rapid short bursts, incredibly short bursts. So it sounds like like really really loud. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would have been something that could have woken them up. Then the screams would have woken somebody up. So the idea that that was used to incapacitate her didn't fit with me. So I started looking into it. I did find that a spokesperson for Air Taser did send what they felt was the closest uh, approximation for the dimensions that they were sent. Uh, although they also, they, one of the experts who worked for them said that um, that's where the similarities end, is the dimensions between the prongs. That's it. And they said that they are well aware of what kinds of marks are made by a stun gun because they've seen literally hundreds, hundreds of people get hit with a stun gun because it's testing things very, very common. And they said that the marks made by a person on a person who's been hit by a stun gun are very erratic, very chaotic. There can be several of them all over in the area because the natural reaction of a person who's been hit by a stun gun is to jerk away. And part of that is the galvanic response of electricity running through muscle. It just causes that muscle to tense and, and jerk back. So that's not the case with what happened with those marks on Jean Benet. Uh, there was no movement. There was no sign of multiple, multiple things. Also, the, the, another uh, individual, uh, Dr. Robert Stratbucker, uh, conducted several experiments on stun guns. He's considered to be a courtroom expert in stun guns. And he said that it's pure nonsense that a stun gun would leave a blue mark between the red marks on the skin as Lou Smith claimed. That was utter nonsense. Like it, it would just would not happen. I uh, said, quote, I have not seen ever, ever any blue marks, and I don't know what the cause of any blue marks could be from a stun gun. So that to me kind of kills the stun gun hypothesis. I mean, it's possible that one was used, but if it was used, it wasn't while she was in her bedroom. It did not incapacitate her. And if it was used, it was used while she was being strangled mm -hmm. and when she wouldn't have been able to respond. Or it could have just been some other object she was hit with. Could have been. I think the police said that it was a, uh, like a, a pin or something that there was, um, something uh, on either end of the pin and it was pressed into her skin uh in those two places could have caused it yeah. could, have, could have caused it there's a number of different things that could have caused it but lou smith was positive that it was a stun gun positive yeah. and this is an investigator that otherwise does a good job right? yeah. so i think that speaks to how frustrating this case is and how there's just so much not known people start to fill in uh, the gaps with yeah. just you know doing the best they can it's an interesting theory uh, but it, it sounds like, you know, based on what you're saying, it probably was not a stun gun. Yeah, very unlikely to have been a stun gun uh, based on on the physics and the and the physiology stuff that happens with stun guns. I just watched one of those videos, Mike. I've never seen someone actually get hit with a stun gun. Maybe probably in the movies or something I have. But just watch this guy get hit with one three times. And it was exactly the reaction you just said, that he just jumps back or did it on his side and he jumps like immediately. It's not like he had to think about it and think, oh, let me endure this, this, uh, this pain right now, I'm just immediately going to jump. Um, so how much more so perhaps on a six-year-old? Right. They're very, very painful. People talk about if they've been hit by a stun gun, you know it. It was very painful. It hurts a lot. Um, what's what's even more interesting is the the range tasers, the ones that have they have the barbs that come out oh, yeah, and right. hit over a distance. And if anyone is going to be trained to use them or carry them, they have to go through that. It, mm -hmm. It's a, a requirement in order to carry one legally. In most states, you have to have experienced what it's like. So they'll take and put di you know diodes on your back and then clip the things to it. And every single time they have two people hold you underneath the arms because that one is going to drop you to the ground because that's going to cause so much to flow and all of your muscles will lock up. Mm -hmm. But once the trigger is released, you're fine again. Every time. So, the, you know, it's the myth that the electricity knocks you out. I suppose if, if you get hit by one of those and fall forward, you could smash your head and, right. and not get knocked out. Yeah. Yeah. But there's no indication of those kinds of barbs on Jean Benet's body. 
Now we were talking about a, a handheld small pronged stun gun is what Lou Smith said that it was used. Good analysis, Mike. It was good. Yes, yeah, so, so in this case, we see that um, you know, nothing ever happened. Chaminade Ramsey was dead. No one was held accountable. The Ramseys were exonerated. Burke was never a suspect, as I mentioned. Many other people you know, were investigated, 1,600, nothing. None of them. Uh, we were talking before uh, we were recording that this is a case that's interesting because there have been a lot of civil lawsuits, right? Like just back and forth, defamation. I think most of them were dismissed or, you know, nothing happened or whatever. But a lot of people, you know, very sensitive about being accused. And uh, the Ramses, I think, sued people. Burke sued someone. People sued the Ramses. Like it was back and forth, you know, because, yeah, I think it just probably came from, you know, there's no information. People were frustrated, and you know, they take some wild guesses or whatever. Well, more than guesses, I think there were some accusations. I mean, a guess is a guess, but I think some people said, you know, this person did it, that person did it. Right. And you know, I, even though nothing came of it with the lawsuits, as I understand it, I think it just speaks to, you know, no one, of course, wanted to be associated with the crime, and there wasn't enough evidence to really conclusively say. We have theories, but there's no way to conclusively say who is responsible. Uh, so uh, we see that you know time goes on. Uh, in 1999, the DA announces there will be no indictments. Uh, in 2008, after uh, Patsy's death in 2006, she died in 2006 at age 49 of ovarian cancer. In 2008, uh, John, Patsy, and Burke are exonerated. Um, again, there's people that disagree, but that was the, the last word on that. Uh, the police did start new interviews in, in 2010. In 13, we see uh, a report about a grand jury that had voted to indict John and Patsy in 1999, but nothing, it wasn't moved forward. And it wasn't for murder, I don't think. I, th I think I, I read somewhere before it was some other charges, uh, but they didn't pursue them. Allowing child abuse or right. something along yeah, it wasn't, those lines. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't murder, it wasn't homicide right, right. or kidnapping or anything like that. So the case is... Unsolved. Uh, again, Patsy passed away in 06. I think John got remarried. Mm -hmm. And uh, Burke was on uh, the Phil McGraw show there. Uh, and and yeah, we're big fans of Phil McGraw on the show. <laughs> the amazing, big fans. The amazing Phil McGraw. And essentially just said, if I remember right, I mean, it was, it was more than just one thing he said, but essentially he had nothing to do with it. That's what he said. And that's really, that's it. The case, the case is open. It's a, you know, there's no statute of limitations. For, for homicide or kidnapping I think one of the one of the most interesting side like side notes was uh, John Mark Carr mm -hmm. and his involvement right yes and, and that was just a really weird involvement because he really didn't have like there's no evidence that he had any involvement right this was but one, it was or two months after Patsy died right that's when we see the a former school teacher John Mark Carr arrested after confessing so everybody thought hey right. It's it's been solved. He was in, he was in Thailand sending emails under various pseudonyms, uh, Daxis uh, or Dark Prince, D R K, P R N Z, and even Alexis. He later changed his legal name to Alexis Valoran Reich. Uh, but uh, he would send you know Carr would send these emails, pen names. Uh, saying all sorts of stuff about you using all sorts of details that some investigators at the time thought only a killer would know mm -hmm. things like um that on her on jambini's underwear it had the word wednesday instead of you know just being white or into so just speculating that was a detail that that he knew that he knew um but in 2006 there was still Google. <laughs> yeah. There's still, still all sorts of ways of digging deep, but he, he really, like he confessed, um, he, he, cl he claimed that he had drugged, sexually assaulted and then accidentally killed her. Um, he did make statements to the media that, that it was an accident that she died accidentally. And then like investigators looked further into things. His DNA didn't match the DNA that was found on John Penny's body. They also knew that while sexual assault couldn't be ruled out, they didn't have any evidence that it had happened either. Mm -hmm. So they ended up, you know, 
pushing him on it. And he said that now he didn't, like he wasn't there. But then he's done other interviews since where he's very cagely said, I watched one of those yesterday. And he very cagely said, like, like, I'm not going to say anything that could get me, you know, put in jail for 30 years. I'm just saying I didn't do it. I wasn't, you know, but, you know, I wasn't the only one there. And he alludes to that there was somebody else there and that that person killed her. Was he in the area? Did they check and see if he was in the area or was he in the they country? They couldn't, couldn't find any indication that he was in the area at the time. Hmm. I remember he lived in, it was in Alabama and they were in Colorado at the time. I mean, they couldn't, investigators couldn't say he wasn't there, right. but they couldn't find any evidence that he was either. Two months later, he would uh, send an email <clears throat> seeking a, a literary uh, company or agent um, to publish a manuscript that some might find controversial. So maybe just looking for some kind of fame yeah. hour or something like that. It, it, it seems likely that it was not a case of him having actually been involved, but wanting to capture some of that fame, yeah. capture some of that. And you should maybe, have sued somebody. That's how you get in. should have. You should have just sued somebody. But, you know, because she said, I was writing a screenplay like this back in 1995. <laughs> That's right. And then, you know, that Mel Gibson movie came out. It ruined my chances. And then this whole thing, this is exactly what happened in my screenplay. Or I own the copyright this, on the right, note or something. Right. <laughs> right. Look at uh, this note I wrote. Right. It was from 1994, <laughs> and it's the exact same thing. It Look. looks like I wrote it yesterday, but I didn't. I did, yeah, it, but everything that came from he was a very interesting lead. In, in 2006, a lot of people thought, and finally, like, finally, it's been you know been so many years. Yeah, you know, it's been it's been a decade, and and we finally have somebody, and only only that it was there's nothing. Like, it, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't actually him. Like, he didn't actually have any involvement in it. And there's no way to, to prove that he did. Yeah, so a or, case that or, uh, 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 sadly probably will never... And be. I, do, I do want to apologize. It seems that there may be a uh, some uh, transgender things going on with, with Carr. Um, so I, I may not be using the proper pronouns. But I, I, don't, I don't know. There, apparently there was an uh, intent to undergo gender reassignment surgery. Oh, something but, after he... Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. at least again, I don't know what proper pronouns there are for, for, for Carr. Um, but his legal name at the time of his arrest was John Mark Carr mm -hmm. and, and was identified as male. So, so that's where this case, uh, you know, this, this wraps up. There's, there's no finding. There's, uh, you know, tons of people whose DNA has been checked or whatever. Nothing. Uh, Ramsey's cleared, Burke cleared, everyone cleared. It's just, it's done. The case is, is essentially a cold case. I don't even know if they have an active law enforcement presence investigating anything. I think it's just probably just open for ideas at this point. From the tabloids, because we know we're going to see them mm -hmm. for at there, least the There's going to be more articles written a few days ago on the, mm -hmm. on the case. We're covering it here on the murder part. Like it, I think the biggest thing that is an issue with this is so unresolved. Like, there's nothing. There's no resolution at all. It's one of the reasons I get drawn to watching Unsolved Mysteries. Mm -hmm. I, I say I'm going to reference that a lot because it's just one of those having things be unresolved is not satisfying for people. want to know the answer. That's why I think it draw, this case draws because nobody, there is no answer. Nope. We don't know what and, happened. And frankly, because Patsy's dead. She died of cancer 2000, uh, 2006. Mm -hmm. And John's not... Not a young man. I think he'll be he'll he'll probably pass at some point. And everyone's going to. Spoiler alert. Right. But, <laughs> but but he'll die. Burke, if, if if Burke slept through the whole thing like the, the Ramsey's claim, then he has no information he further info. He doesn't know anything more than we do. He can only speculate too. And uh, but being from inside it and growing up inside the whole thing, it is gonna color his his entire outlook on life in general. Mm -hmm. And the investigation was so poorly handled from from minute one. Yeah, it really was. That that I don't think we're going to be able to find much more. And that touch DNA could have been anything. It could have been on there when the when the clothes were shipped. Yeah, if it was brand new and hadn't been washed, it 
could have been the inspector who inspected it. Inspector number 17. That's the number I always come up with when I find those <laughs> inspector slips. 17. It's always inspector 17. Well, that sounds like a conspiracy. It might be. We're covering that next on Alien Lizard Cuminoids. <laughs> inspector 17 conspiracy. Out to who get you, is, Mike. Right? Who is the inspector? Clouseau. <laughs> Inspector you know, Peter Sellers, a fascinating guy. I had a lot of requests for a video on Peter Sellers. And I knew a little bit about him, but I read some more like to see if it would be a topic that would work. It was a whole big complex mental health history. Fascinating guy and really hysterical in the Pink Panther movies. Yeah. Uh, and uh, who was the guy who used to jump out of the... Uh, there was the guy who used to jump out... Of like the refrigerator, the closet. I forget the name of the character, but it was it was like his sidekick yeah. was into martial arts, and he he did it to keep him sharp. It's hysterical. Interesting. Peter Sellers actually wanted to play James Bond. Like he he actually did uh, Casino Royale, which was Ian Fleming's very first James Bond book, and they got the rights to do Casino Royale. But and he really wanted to be a serious. He wanted to be a serious role. He wanted to be James Bond, the dapper. You know. Very, very, uh, he wanted to be the cool, collected spy. Because mm -hmm. uh, there's some really harsh things that happen in that movie. So, but right. <laughs> once he was attached to it, a, you know, a comedic director jumped on and was like, I'll, I'll do it. If Peter Sellers is doing it, I'll do it. Because I want to be part of this whole comedy thing. And just pushed everything. And they, they changed the name in that movie to Jimmy Bond. Like, And Peter Sellers railed against it. He's like, no, I want this to be serious. It's supposed to be serious. It ended up being a complete comedy, and it was a travesty. And Peter Sellers said it was a travesty of a movie, and he hated it afterwards because he wanted to be the first James Bond in film. Mm -hmm. And technically he was, although yeah. it was Jimmy, Jimmy Bond. Yeah, but best known, of course, for, for the, as the, the, the Pink Panther. Inspector Clouseau, yeah. yeah. Inspector Clouseau. Yeah. So uh, great physical comedy and, and a pretty good actor as well yeah. but uh you yeah, ever I mean, seen any of the james bond movies any of them i have i have seen one it just doesn't really interest me too yeah. much you he's know? seen one yeah. there's there's a bunch of them so yeah I, it's not not a franchise that really interests yeah. me. i think i've seen every i think i've seen every one <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, yeah. frankly i don't know why it doesn't interest me i don't know if it's just like the hype around it yeah i think that might be it like it's an action movie and that's cool and everything but the hype around it it, I don't know that it really lived up to that in my mind, and maybe I saw the wrong one. I don't know. Did you see one with Timothy Dalton? I have that no could, idea. That could be the expert. Yeah, no yeah if, if you saw it. License to Kill, that might be that might have killed, might literally have killed any interest in the in the franchise. <laughs> Whatever it was, I probably watched it on TV. I probably didn't really very, very care likely. too much about it at the time it. I was watching you it. Know, it's so. interesting oh, how yeah. time colors things. Like I remember watching James Bond when I was young, and Roger Moore was the current, yeah. right? And I thought Roger Moore was great. And people are like, you know, Roger Moore's like the worst James Bond ever. And I'm like, no, 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 Roger Moore's great. And now I look back, I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see what you're talking about. It was Sean Connery who was the best. Sean Connery was the best. <laughs> Although I think Daniel Craig, because of the reboot, so Daniel Craig's not a, a, it's a different take mm -hmm. on, on a different direction on everything. And it's starting to pick up some of that more fantastical stuff that we saw in the other movies. But uh, and I'm looking forward to the new one. And Pierce Brosnan wasn't bad. Either. Pierce Brosnan wasn't bad. I mean, he really did bring some more of the dapperness to, to yeah. the role as they were kind of heading back in that direction. But Roger Moore was, he, he was very campy. Where, where Pierce Brosnan crashed and burned was Mamma Mia. He, he can't sing. Right? I thought he did a great job in, in, as James Bond. And then he goes, uh, in Mamma Mia, is like, wow. Like, you have to pass some roles, right? Like, when you're an actor, <laughs> you just have to say, you know what, I, I can't sing. You got to pass on some things. You got to say... You gotta know when to say no. Some some actors have ruined their careers by not by not knowing when to say no, or when to say yes. Like Sean Connery could have been Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, but said, I don't understand all this. Tom Selleck could have been. So, uh, so he chose to do League of Extraordinary Gentlemen instead right. when that became when when Lord of the Rings became successful, and yeah, that didn't go anywhere. And that ended his career. Was the last movie he ever did. Like mm -hmm. when John Travolta did Hairspray. And he was like played the, the role of the woman in there. It was, it was yeah. awfully strange. More like more like when John Travolta did um, Saturday Night Fever. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I don't know. Or I, when John Travolta did the other. Oh, no. I thought he did a good job of Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> well, no, I'm sorry. It was the sequel, the Staying Alive, the oh. sequel to Saturday Night Fever. Like that's where he went went bad. But John say, Travolta. People, people love Saturday Night Fever. Right. That but. Saturday Night Fever was the, was the good one. It was, it was Staying Alive, which was the sequel mm -hmm. to Saturday Night Fever, which was which was awful. And, and nobody 
should ever watch that movie. Well, John Travolta is also in an L. Ron Hubbard yeah. book, Battlefield, movie Battlefield after, Earth. Yeah, which which was was a he should have said no to that one, but he that was, was in, he was in part of Scientology. He still is part of Scientology. Um, but yeah, yeah has, a, has a big fan base. He's got some movies that are really good, and then some movies, and just like every other movie, is bad. Like Look Who's Talking, great. Mm, yeah. Look That's Who's like Talking it. too. Eh. Look who's talking now. Just never should have been made. Yeah, sometimes it just got worse. It, go. it just got worse. You got to yeah. let some of these concepts go. You know, Battlefield Earth, terrible, terrible face off. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. He's also in like a one called Phenomenon, which I think probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, yeah. You know, like uh, it was it was, a, it was a chance to do more acting, like it was more, more dramatic role. But uh, Tom Selleck could have been Indiana Jones, right? But he was a Magnum PI, so that wasn't really his fault. He didn't pass on it, but he was supposed <laughs> to be Indiana Jones. Of course, Harrison Ford. Um, I think Harrison Ford is a great actor. I'm a big fan of Harrison Ford, so I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm glad he got. I, remember, I think, I think Tom Selleck also did like was trying to stack up against that with doing Runaway. Mm-hmm. Which, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know Tom Selleck's a very good actor. Yes, underrated, I think. Yeah, yeah. and I, and a glorious mustache. <laughs> <laughs> my my beard approves of his mustache. <laughs> People in the comments approve of your beard. So. Yeah, well, they do. The beard thanks them. Every single compliment the beard enjoys tremendously. It's a they very vain. Com- it's a very vain beard. It really is. They all get replies for that. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, so Jean Benet Ramsey, one of the uh, again, I'll use the word classic cases, one of the notorious cases in true crime, unsolved, uh, a real mystery. You know, up there with like Madeline McCann, uh, and and just you know, these other mysteries. We don't know if we'll ever get the answer. Although I think Malin McCann is probably closer to being solved. But I, I really doubt John Manny Ramsey will ever be solved. I think, sadly, it's probably frozen in time as an as a incredible mystery. You know, it's like the Zodiac or whatever. Like there's no, you know, uh, Dan Cooper, who's incorrectly called D.B. Cooper. Right. Um, who's very likely dead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting when you don't know, right? It, it really drives interest in the case. But there was another hijacking like the Dan Cooper one where the guy was caught. I forget his name. I'll, I'll probably do a video on him someday, but he was the, caught the, and Dan, no one ever talks about it. The Dan Cooper, Dan Cooper case is a, a, fa- a fascinating one. It really is. And we should do that one. Yeah. That, Alien that, lizard humanoids would be better for that one. I think so. Cause that, that's more of a mystery. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's really much more of a, a huge mystery. So very good. So we'll wrap up there on the, uh, jean Ramsey on the, on the murder part. Um, any final thoughts about this? I'm not, I, I'm just, uh, <clears throat> I don't think any of us have, have said or even hinted at who we believe or how we believe this, this murder happened. And I, I don't know that I could even, you know, I, I've been kind of back and forth the whole time that I've been researching this. And there's certainly a lot that, <clears throat> a lot of weird things here, things that just don't add up and things that you know, they don't see in many cases like these, if any. So maybe that indicates that it was somebody in the family or close to the family, a caregiver or somebody perhaps that worked at the house or something, who knows. Uh, but also weird things that could indicate that somebody outside of the house. Um, so just, I don't even know that I could, you know, give a guess. Like, I believe it was this, or I give a percentage that I believe it's this much percentage that it was this, you know, theory of how it was done. Um, I don't know. Do you guys have any any thoughts on that? I don't know. Like, like... Other cases like Darling Lynn, I could say I'm 50-50 on whether she did it or not. Or uh, like Scott Peterson, even though the trial was handled horribly and they didn't have evidence, eh, 80% sure he did it. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, this case is one I don't, I don't have any ideas. I don't have right. because there's just not enough evidence of anything. Like that we don't have enough. Even though there's plenty of evidence of, of what happened to her. We don't, I, 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 it doesn't tell a narrative. It doesn't construct any kind of narrative. And a lot of different supposition can lead you into a narrative that makes sense. And I think that's the most frustrating thing about this case is that it, it doesn't have a narrative aspect that helps us to understand what happened to this six-year-old little girl. She, she died a, a terrible, torturous death with a blow to the head that would have been incredibly painful and then being strangled, which would have also, which is also mm-hmm. painful and terrifying. And, and if a stun gun was used, it would have been mm-hmm. during that time period. So it would have been more pain on top of that. And it, it's just, it's this horrible thing. And again, as you said, 
very beginning, we kind of sometimes lose the fact that it is a six-year-old girl that died. But it's the not having a narrative that really, I think, drives interest in the case and drives it trying to figure it out. Like, we got to know because not having an ending to that narrative is so unsatisfying. It glides on a razor's edge, and I think I mean, that's one of the reasons we select cases to, to do. I mean, if it was yeah. if it was 100% one way or whatever, it wouldn't be as, as interesting. And people wouldn't be talking about it. Right. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, when you look at a case, when you look at evidence, uh, you have kind of like a two-theory case like this, intruder or, the, or inside job. Uh, evidence stacks on each side, right? And, and every time in this case, you get someone like the Ramsey side, you get someone on the intruder side. So it's like, well, I don't know. And, and they just, they're pointing in opposite directions, different theories about how everything happened. It's not like you go through with one killer and, and you deviate somewhere, a branch down the way. It's from the very beginning, the whole case was different if you believe one way over the other. Which, of course, is you know, how a lot of these cases work, but it's, it's frustrating. Because you end up in a camp. You commit, oh, I'm in the Ramsey camp, or I'm in the intruder camp. I'm somewhere in the middle, but, it, you know, if, like I say, if like, somebody's going to be a million dollars, like somebody's like, I know the answer. I'll give you a million dollars if, you, if you're right. I'd probably go with, with the Ramseys. Like, not, not like 70 or 80%, probably like 55% or whatever, like just barely. Sure. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, just, just because it's, I, I believe Patsy wrote the note. I, I tend to believe she wrote the note, but she may not have. And that, again, that's, you go in a whole different direction, you could be back to the intruder. Right. So it's certainly possible yeah. that and it was an intruder. It, it, the, the kind of intruder who might have done that, it just it baffles my mind what they might have been going through. Because again, to do this, they would have had to have been incredibly blasé about just walking around a house where people are home and asleep upstairs just writing notes yeah doing whatever like very it, calm yeah very calm yeah yeah and i think there were some other similar crimes in the area that we, we didn't talk about that but i think there were some other similar homicides which leans toward the intruder theory you know maybe it was that intruder or whatever but yeah it's it's it would be a strange killing for the ramses to do and a strange one for an intruder to do Right. It's just a strange, strange murder to happen. The strangest thing I think we didn't talk about was that Santa Claus did it. Oh, yeah. That's right. There's a whole <laughs> theory, right? I mean, whole, whole theory. There was a guy uh, who uh, played Santa Claus at their Christmas parties for several years and, you know, had a big, bushy, white beard and really enjoyed playing Santa Claus and being Santa Claus and he had and Jean Benet had formed a relationship and there were definitely accusations against him at the time. The, the friend Jean Benet's friend had said Jean Benet had told her Santa was going to come back and uh, give me a special gift or I don't, I don't know. Well, there was, was a note that he wrote that said right after know? Christmas you'll you'll get something special. Okay. So she or Jean something Benet special will happen to you. Like right after Christmas, something special will happen. Jamine told that to the friend. The friend said, "Well, yeah, sure. Santa Claus is coming to our house." Said, no, no, this one's special. It's going to happen after Christmas. Yeah, and the police did find that note that he had given her that said that in, in her bedroom when they when they finally looked in her bedroom and started <laughs> investigating there. Yeah, but he was cleared as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he was. Yeah, so he was cleared. Like so his, again, like when you start looking at it, it's like, oh, this looks promising, and then. They all, all the theories disintegrate yeah. in the light of all the other evidence. A very frustrating case that way. I'll, yeah. say, I'll say Santa Claus doesn't exactly fit through the window either. <laughs> right. Like, going down chimneys using magic is one thing, but kind of slipping in through a basement window. I've seen, I have seen pictures and video of this particular gentleman, and I, I, Lou Smith could fit through there, but then Santa Claus could not. <laughs> I couldn't, and you know, I know how difficult it would be. But if an intruder did do it, it was somebody who was just okay, just yeah. roaming around, mm -hmm. looking at stuff, yeah, checking out, ice. checking out stuff. Cold, 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 cold. And if it was the Ramses, they did a phenomenal job of covering everything up. Yeah, it, well, in, in the most peculiar way, like writing the note, right. and like what, like why would you? That only that would only make them seem. Like, that would only uh, lead to their to their arrest and conviction, right? Like that's a bad move to create evidence against yourself. But it being so, it seeming like such a bad move would also make me think. Well, wait a minute. If they're doing it, maybe they're intentional about like they're 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 gonna say, oh, maybe it's us. But then think, no, that'd be too easy. Like so, that would make me actually go away from. 
thinking it was the parents because that would just be too easy of an explanation. And who knows? Maybe they were thinking that if they did it. No, there's no I mean, they were like, wait, they're in this game where it's like back and forth yeah. and like they're it's this chess game. And yeah, you know, it, it could be. But but again, now you're into the master criminal realm. So you like, think that I think that right. you think that I think that you think that I think that you did it. But I know that you. <laughs> it's at least the Princess Bride thing. <laughs> But that would have been the movie poster to look for. That would have been a movie poster to look for, yes. Uh, but it, it's one of those like it seems like it's such a like a terrible idea to cover up their plan, but if if the if if big supposition, if they did it, it worked. I wonder if it's like a Gary Ridgeway. Right. Remember right. he introduced evidence that, that could have been connected to him, it never was, but like he left uh what was it, like gum and right. papers and stuff like he tried to Trash confuse. And, yeah, he tried to confuse the police, and you would think, no, no, never take something that you handled and put it on a crime scene. But he made that work. Yeah, he broke the rules and made it work. Yeah, it, it's one of those. If if Patsy did it, if Patsy did it, and I'm not saying that she did, she got away with it because she died. Mm -hmm. She she lived the rest of her life without being charged. If John Ramsey did it, then he's gotten away with it for so long. If Burke did it, he's. Making away, and again, there's no, there's no real evidence that Burke had anything to do with it. But again, based on fictional stories, you say it, it becomes plausible the more you think about it. Right. Well, yeah. everything is still a possibility. Yeah, right. everything's right. a possibility again because the narrative just doesn't make sense. Yeah, even her falling down the steps, or whatever, like everything, everything is still in play. Nothing's been ruled out, and that's another element that's frustrating. Like, if there was a video, and we see like. Okay, no one went in the window during a certain time, whatever. We could rule something out, but nothing can be ruled out. Yeah, nothing can be ruled out. The whole timeline's available. Other th other little tiny details that lend like to the the intruder thing is the the um, the part that was used for the garage, the uh, paintbrush handle, was apparently recently the brush part was had recently been broken off, couldn't be found anywhere in the house. Patsy said she didn't break it. She didn't know where the where where the the tip of it was, where the brush part was. They couldn't find it anywhere in the house. If the if somebody had broken in and had used that and broke it while they were twisting, snapped that hat off, took it with them. Took it with them. That leads to the the perpetrator. Although Patsy could have lied, had broken that herself and got rid of it. A long, months before, yeah, you don't know. Could could have been months before. It could have been broke. It could have been Burke broke it days beforehand and hid it, and it just happened to be you know in the basement. And and grabbed and used mm -hmm. because it was it was there again. We don't know, and all of those things are equally plausible. It's that's the problem of right. the case. That's what's so frustrating about it, and that's why it bring, brings people back to it. Yeah, and, and, and keep in mind too. With, I think with John and Ramsey, this is a case where you found the body. You you found the body not long after the murder occurred. You know how the victim was killed. It's in a domicile in a residence. This wasn't like, you know, oh, the person was walking on the street and, we, and they disappeared. This, this was, no, we have the body. We know about when she died, the cause of death, and yet still no solution. It's not like Natalie Holloway. Right. You know, right. Which you can see on the murder part. That's right. That was, that was another murder part. Yeah, you know, you have somebody just you know, seen with people, seen with three guys, and disappears. And no evidence has ever been found. Uh, this, is, this is completely different. Yeah. Right. We, we, we know Jean Benet is dead. We know how she died. Mm -hmm. And they have the body. We just... The we body know, was there the whole time. We know where she died, pretty much. We know she died in that house. We're, we don't know, actually, what room she may have died in. We don't know whether she died in the basement or whether she died in her room or the bathroom. We don't know any of that because, again, there was problems with the investigation and collection of evidence. But we know basically where she died. Mm -hmm. We know where the crime scene is. We know... Everything about her, but we don't know who, who killed her. Yeah, super frustrating mystery. All mysteries are, are frustrating, but this one until yeah, they're solved. To be yeah, to be so close, like to say, well, no, this is. You know, if you look at all the check boxes, and I was talking about any case, and I said, no, you know, you have all these things. We have all these things. You would say, yeah, that one's solved, or at least you know, we we, we kind of know who did it, even if they weren't arrested. No idea in this yeah. case. Unbelievable. No. Yeah. So that is. Jamine Ramsey, please put any uh, thoughts you have with this case in the comments. You know, do, who do you think did it? Which way you're leaning? What the probabilities are? Other evidence that we 
didn't include here and kind of which way you think that leans. I'm really curious to see what your thoughts are on this uh, really uh, frustrating uh, and fascinating uh, murder mystery. So thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks to all you. Uh, Again, please put any thoughts in the comments and we will talk to you soon.